I don't want to get into it. But this is the standard one. Okay. There's been gazillions of quantum throws of the dice in the last 3.8 billion years since life started. If space-time is continuous, which is what the physicists think, although it may not be on the smallest length scale, the Planck length scale, but let's say it is, then you'd have to carry out an infinite number of simulations. In fact, you'd have to carry out what's called a second-order infinite number of simulations, because the real line is what's called second-order infinite, which is, if you want to hear about it, I'll tell you about it. Anyway, you'd have to carry out a vastly many or infinitely many simulations, which you can't do because it's infinite. Suppose you could. How would you ever prove that one of your simulations actually matched the specific history of all the quantum events that happened in the evolution of our biosphere for the past 3.8 billion years? You obviously can't, right? I rest my case. The physicists can't carry out a simulation and confirm it for the evolution of our biosphere, but the particular quantum event that occurred could have changed the entire future evolution of the biosphere. So the physicist can't do that, and I'm going to show him a little bit that he can't deduce it either. So what I want to say is, not that there's anything funny about your heart from the point of view of physics, although there is, and I'll get to it, but there's no élan vital. It's that the physicist cannot deduce or, or simulate the evolution of the biosphere. That's going to mean that biology is... Um, not reducible to physics, and I'm going to show you one other argument <coughs> in two senses. It's not epistemologically reducible, okay, in terms of knowing, but it's not ontologically reducible. Ontologically, I mean, what, what really exists in the universe? Are we really just particles in motion? The answer is no. And the reason is, is that A, we can't deduce it, and B, um, uh, things that have causal consequences in their own right, like hearts pumping blood, um, are real, and the heart's real. So now let me pause and tell you something that, that in my book comes a lot later, but I'm going to tell you right now. And it's, it bears on this issue of the heart being real. And it's really simple, but really surprising. You wouldn't have thought it, but as soon as I tell you, you'll say, oh, sure, okay? Does everybody know what a protein is? I mean, it's this linear string of amino acids, right? Everybody familiar with that? Okay, so there's 20 <coughs> kinds of amino acids. Okay, a typical protein in you has three or 400 amino acids. So let's, let's imagine a protein length 200. So how many possible proteins are there length 200? Well, there's 20 in each position, so it's 20 times 20 times 20 times 20, 200 times. That's 20 raised to the 200th power, which turns out to be about 10 raised to the 260th power. Okay? This is a big number. It makes the American national debt look small. <laughs> Under George Bush. Okay. Who I think is the worst president in the United States history. Um, and I'm willing to defend that. <laughs> I have defended it. Thank you. I've done it in the United States in front of 500 businessmen and waited for my passport to be dinged. Coming <laughs> back to Canada so I couldn't get back home. Uh, and I'm glad I did. Uh, but I'm glad I got home, too. Okay, so there's, there's something very interesting about this. The shortest time scale in the universe is what's called the Planck time scale. It's 10 to the minus 43rd seconds. That's really short. Okay? The universe is 10 to the 17th seconds old since the Big Bang, plus or minus. There's 10 to the 80th particles in the known universe. If the universe were doing nothing whatsoever except on the Planck time scale, making proteins length 200, which it's obviously not, it would take 10 to the 39th repetitions of the history of the universe to make all proteins length 200 once. Got it? This means something physical. In the first place, it means we don't have them all. In the second, the second thing it means, is, it means a lot of things. It means that the number of proteins that can have existed is an infinitesimally tiny fraction of the possible. Okay? This means something that we've never thought about. At least at the level uh, above atoms of 
molecules and organisms like bunny rabbits and butterflies and cities and Chevrolets and operas and movies and Empire State Buildings and stuff. Okay, at an indefinite level of hierarchical complexity, the universe is vastly non-repeating. The mathematical term for it is non-ergotic. We are on a unique trajectory at these levels of complexity. Nobody's paying any attention to it, but it's true. And that means something physical. It means that history enters when you cannot exhaust the set of the possible. Okay? That's what it means. So if you take a gas at equilibrium, and you all know what that is, it's a gas with a bunch of molecules and it bouncing around, it comes to an equilibrium temperature and pressure, <coughs> and in terms of the macroscopic properties of temperature and pressure, it stops changing. It's not true for the evolution of the biosphere. And that bears on what I said about the heart. So I want you to think about this. Most complex things, like hearts, will never, ever, ever, ever get to exist. Funny idea, huh? They won't get to exist. Ever. But hearts exist. And hearts exist because Darwin's right and natural selection came along and it built hearts. So hearts really are ontologically emergent and what makes hearts special isn't that they beat the laws of physics because they don't. It's that they are a very special organization of structure and process by which they manage to carry out the function of squirting blood. And that came to exist in the biosphere. And we've all got one, unless you happen to have two. Or not, in which case I'd like to meet you. Okay? Um, okay? So I want you to get the feeling for this. Because the universe is non-ergotic, complex things that get to exist in the biosphere are really special. And this special organization of process and structure by which the heart works, like a car works, okay, has come to exist. And the physicist cannot explain that. He cannot deduce it, and he can't simulate it. But it's real in the universe. It's ontologically and epistemologically real. So hearts are not just particles in motion, although they are just particles in motion. They're not just particles in motion because they've come to exist in the real universe. Here, so have we, so have trees, so have the chairs. Okay? Now the other thing I want to say is you can't reduce biology to physics because think of Darwin's idea. We all understand it. He read Malthus. Uh, food increases linearly, organisms increase geometrically, and he says, ah! Because organisms are going to run out of food, they're going to compete with one another. Fitter variants, if there's heritable variation, are going to win. I got this great idea in natural selection, and he's right. It's one of the great ideas in human history. Could the physicist deduce it from physics? No. Darwin's idea stands in its own right. I just told you what Darwin did. He read Malthus, and he reasoned the way I just told you, and he got to his idea. Could the physicist in, in, in do it by induction? Well, no. In the first place, he can't even get to water. Suppose he got to a tiger chasing a gazelle and you know, found out that a little change in the tiger's foot pad might make it better at chasing the gazelle and got a bunch of instances by deduction in which 